Hi, I am Christy Paul, and I have a strong passion in my heart to see people come to Christ. Join me as we raise up an army of powerful prayer warriors with the same passion to see Jesus Christ glorified and to bring this nation of ours back to God. Hello, beautiful people. It's always a great pleasure to meet you here again. I am Christy Paul and you are watching Bring the Nation Back to God. Well, today I have with me a very special guest. He's actually the manager of Ealing Soup Kitchen. Let me introduce you to him. Uh, Mr. Andrew McClay. Hi, how are you doing, uh, Christy? I'm really good. Thank you for coming down, by the way. No problem. Thanks for, thanks for inviting Lovely. me. Lovely. So we're going to hear all about the soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. So first, tell me, what was the idea behind Ealing Soup Kitchen? Yeah, so uh, a bunch of churches in Ealing noticed that there was a big homeless problem and um, nobody seemed to be doing anything about it. And mm -hmm. so the churches kind of met together. Um, There's about eight or nine local churches um, and they sort of thought, what, what, what can we do? So we thought, we've got it. they got a van. Mm -hmm. um, and so they basically just clubbed in, bought a van and then started serving soup from a van on wow. Maddock Lane. Um, it started from a van? Yeah, wow. it started from a van. Um, so, so the homeless people would line up and get their f uh, food and then and then go and um, it started from there and then the police actually ended up moving us on oh. um, because you can't you can't sort of do that without a license. Okay. So then the church started thinking, oh, well, let's put it in the church premises. And so, from that day onward, it's it's been inside St John's Church uh, since 1973. In Ooh. fact, so yeah. Wow, really that, cool. that has been a very long time ago, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so let let me know about. How many people would you get on a regular basis? So on a regular basis, we probably serve 400 or so. Wow. Um, a week or so. Like, like, so we have, we have four different services. Um, we have a Saturday, Sunday, a Monday, and a Friday. Oh, so is it like a service? Um, or is it, it just like an open day where everyone knows that they can come and get some food? Or is it like a service where they come in and, you know, get activities done um what? so we have certain days for certain things so on, okay. on the weekends it's basically a soup kitchen so you ever been in a soup kitchen it's basically like a like a restaurant effectively like a very low key restaurant oh, okay um uh where there's a, a a church group that will cook the food um and they'll make you know curry or spag bowl or something you can make on mass um basically and okay. um usually you'll get like a, a starter which will be a soup then okay. there'll be the main meal which will be you know, curry or something, and then there'll be a dessert. So that could be ice cream, could be apple pie, could be, you know, usually it's quite good food, actually. Oh, lovely. Um, Talking about food, I yeah. know I love food a lot. <laughs> it's my favorite topic. What's your most favorite menu there? Ooh, that's a tough one, because there are really good food there. I'm just, um, I would say I'm a big pasta fan, so okay. I, I like, um, the, there's, a, there's a team that does this spag bowl, which is incredible. There's another team that does pa um, homemade pizza, mm. and that's always really, really cool. Oh, um, wow. And curry is great too, but um, the problem is a lot of people do it. And when loads of people do it, you sort of start to sort of not like it as much. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a team called ECC that uh, do this amazing food. So, ECC, if you're watching, your food is the best. <laughs> oh, lovely. So, tell me, what are some of the activities or the services that you offer at the soup kitchen? Yeah, so on a Friday, we have a what's called a hub basically and if you're homeless and you need some advice then we will um we'll sort of advertise ourselves and you can come in um during the day and we provide help with housing council help um anything to do with benefits so if okay. you if you need to claim benefits or if you've got a problem with your benefits we also have hairdressers there so we have oh, two hairdressers yeah. on site we have um, a shower um and we have clothes Oh, wow. um, and then we also have things like GPs that come sporadically. We have um, legal aid people that come and help anyone. We've got an IT station so people can check their emails or apply for jobs. So mm -hmm. we try and make it as practical and as helpful for them as possible. It's like a one-stop shop because you know, if you're homeless and you are in real need, then often you know, there's a lot of things you need to cram in <laughs> into yeah, that particular yeah. time. So we try and do everything at once and then it calms them down and they go away feeling like they've got a bit of hope. Wow, 
that's incredible. Mm -hmm. So take us through what a day at the soup kitchen looks like. Well, every day is kind of varied and different. I suppose on the weekends, the the um, the, the church team would come in early and then they would start prepping the food and they um, need quite a few volunteers to do that. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have a someone on security just in case there are, there is any any issues because quite a lot of the guys come in. Some of them have alcohol problems or drug problems, but that's just par for the course. The, the main thing for us is just to love them as, as best as we possibly can. And we do that generally through food. So um, so we have people who will do that. And then um, if there's something that we can help them with whilst they're there, mm -hmm. then then that's what we're equipped for. And I mean, most days at the soup kitchen is pretty much like that. You know, we go in early to set up and then whilst we're there, we try and be as helpful as possible. So, you know, you need a place to stay. Fine. Let's look. Let's let's speak to some people, try and get some landlords in, mm -hmm. try and um, speak to the council on your behalf. Um, you need help with benefits, we can sort that. You need to access things, we can sort all of that sort of stuff whilst you're there, and then you go away happy. So that's kind of what it looks like, but it's it's a lot of setup time. Okay. As I'm sure there are in, in most industries, there's so much back end stuff that you end up having yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, and then and then uh, you know the actual time that we're with the with the clients is actually much shorter than the time that it takes them to set up and then to actually <laughs> to, to pack down. But you know that that's just any industry, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot of back end. Um, so. Through all the things that you've experienced um, setting up uh, in the soup kitchen, what's the most surprising thing that you've encountered? Uh, I think one of the things that I was most surprised by when I first started at the soup kitchen is how lovely most of the homeless people are. I mm. think, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think most people in society have a perception of what they believe a homeless person to be like. And yeah. usually that's someone who is a bit gruff and a bit scary and we don't necessarily want to get to know. Um, but actually what we forget is that these are Jesus's people. These are God's people. You know, he didn't hang out with the cool people. He hung out with the kind of the, the real ruffians and the kind of yeah. the, the real rough stuff. And these guys are the very definition of that, the rough stuff. And so um, it's, it's really important for us to remember that. And I think when when a disaster happens, for example, they go up and they hug one another with, with like, they just really wrap themselves around each other and they really do care about each other's situations. Mm -hmm. And I think, particularly when we live in London and it's so busy and we're walking past one another, sometimes we don't, we don't feel the same way. We're like, our, if, if, if we're not part of the, um, if they're not part of our peripheral vision, oh, yeah. it's very difficult for us to kind of sometimes see what's going on. And I think for them, because they really know what it's like to have nothing, they really do care. And, and that was one of the most amazing things and one of the best things about kind of the faith element too. Because when they pray, they pray with everything they have. Mm. It's not just like a, you know, like a middle class prayer where sometimes people will sit in, in church and, and do this. It's, it really is like a, um, you know, they will give everything that they have mm -hmm. because they don't have anything else. Yeah. So, that, you know, that all is lost, so all is left to gain, you know? Yeah. So it's amazing. So... Um, with encountering that, would you say that the love is more strong around these type of people? I think, yeah, I think in some ways the, the love is stronger because um, because you can see the need straight away. You can kind of see the life on their faces a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And it also <laughs> takes them a long time to kind of learn to trust you and to, and to trust what you're doing in the charity. So um, I think that that does um, mean that then we do get a lot closer to them and, and it becomes more like brothers and sisters and, and family than it does about kind of a transactional thing. It's really, you do treat them like family, they treat you like family. So there is a real sense of kind of love in the room, definitely, I think. Oh, brilliant. Mm. So what does it mean to you when you see the impact that the soup kitchen has had on the people that is, it has um, come in contact with? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's genuinely quite incredible, I think, because it's one thing to talk about the homeless and to see homeless people at tube stations and things like that. But, yeah. but actually um, being able to sort of change their life. So we've, we've um, quite a few of the people that, that uh, are core volunteers of the soup kitchen are ex-homeless people, people that we've directly been able to help. So we've got them off oh. the streets. We've given them opportunities with volunteering. They come to church. They sort of serve. One of them is a um, a lay preacher. It, I, it's wow. it's quite amazing, sort of seeing the transition from 
someone who feels like they can't give anything to anyone to feeling as though they can come into church and, and into, into St. John's giving people hope. I think that is just really incredible, and that's obviously down to, to God and, um, and, and God's sort of grace and peace um, that he gives a lot of the clients when, um, when they arrive at our center. So. Mm, fantastic. Um, share with me some of the stories, at least one of the um, testimonies that these people have had. Well, I'll, I'll share with you the, um, so one of the guys who helps me out, his name's Alan. He is actually now a trustee of our charity. Mm. And he was on the streets for three years. Um, so he basically would sleep outside churches um, because he figured that he wouldn't get beat up. Um, and he had this um, he had a really sad story. He, he, um, he was married and his wife got cancer and died. Um, and wow. um, so he just felt like he didn't really want to um, you know, participate in the world anymore. So he just got a bag and, and left. Wow. Um, and so he kind of was estranged from his whole family, effectively. Um, and, he, and it took him a while, but there were people who were around him who were saying, well, I'm going to the soup kitchen, why don't you come with me? And, oh, no thanks, no thanks, I don't want to be around. Because he didn't want to be around the drugs and the alcohol and the kind of the, um, some of the, the bad stuff that draws mm -hmm. people onto the street. He just didn't want to be a part of it. But eventually someone pulled his leg and he, he came to the, to the soup kitchen. And um, he sort of started to befriend... Um, the staff there and then from there we were able to get him a place to live um, and it's in a kind of a Tudor style house so um, it's okay. it's really lovely and he's got his own flat oh. um, and from there he was able to reconnect with his family um, and he was able to uh, really kind of learn to love himself again and love other people and so he ended up becoming a lay minister, and he's a de deputy ch church warden at St. John's now. Wow. Um, and from there, he's become a trustee of the charity too. So, I mean, he, he's a great example. We've got loads of people who have come through who have come from, you know, completely hopeless to full of hope. And that, to me, is the reason that we do it. It's because um, I think we look at homeless people, and sometimes we think, mm, it's too much for us, too mm -hmm. much for me. I can't do anything about that. But yeah. actually... If you have the right circumstances and if you cultivate people and if you are able to build them up in the right way, you can see a real change in their lives. Yes. And for me, that's kind of the most amazing thing. Yes, I love how you said that we look at homeless people and we think that it's too much. What can we do to help? But like mm. um, you guys are doing at the Ealing Soup Kitchen, you're offering help with housing, giving a hot meal, um, hairdressing, getting them all groomed that's so fantastic yeah um i know um we've just been through the pandemic it's not really over it's subsiding no. at the moment but what effect that has it had on the soup kitchen yes yeah, it's, it's quite a sad time for everybody i think yeah um, so we're finding that our numbers are increasing but not just with homeless people with people who are have lost their jobs Mm. Um, there are destitute families who cannot afford to pay for their um, to buy food anymore, and it's not because they don't have any money. It's because they can't get those those um, emergency slots that the okay. um, supermarket was talking about. So some of them would um, send their families down to our soup kitchen to get food from us. Mm. Um, so we've had all different types of people, people in like suits that are you know hoping to go back to work but can't yet and so it's a kind of a and we've had families with children that have been turning up at the soup kitchen as well and now obviously because things have changed a little bit we are now everything sort of take away so we've lost the personal aspect a little bit because we can't have anybody in the building okay which is really sad because a whole charity is built built on relationship yeah. and building that relationship yeah. um but it is amazing i mean we can still chat to all of the guys that know us we still have a quick chat with them at the window when they come past and we sort of ask them how they are and um, and we've got their number so we're still behind the scenes doing yeah. things like um, there, you know when the government was saying we're going to get um, all the homeless housed into hostels mm. we were making sure that was happening so we were getting Fantastic. we were giving them phones at the, at the drop-in and saying mm. you know here's some phone here's some credit let me take your number I'll give you a call during the, during the week and we'll make sure we get you in and so we have, so we've been doing that. So we, we place quite a number of people through the council. So, um, so we're still able to help, but it's just limited effectiveness. So I think that's the hardest bit. And I think for them, it's really difficult for the homeless because they're stuck in these hostels with four walls all day and they can't really go out because mm -hmm. if they go out, they could potentially die because the average 
lifespan on the street is about 43. Mm. Um, and a lot of them are around that age. So it's really hard, um, really tough for them. Uh, Until 43. Yeah. Wow. So, so it's, it's, it's quite a scary, scary thing. And so for them, I think it's the, it's the relationships they're really missing. And so when they're coming to us now, they really want to have that conversation. But unfortunately, we have to say, really yeah. sorry. You know, you've got to stay two meters away from everybody else and this person needs... So it's really hard. So I'll, I'll try and make sure somebody will call them um, or we can do a catch-up at some point because yeah. it's, it, it is really difficult. And that's the, that is the single hardest thing, I think. Yeah. Mm. Oh, wow. So um, what effect has it had on the volunteers or the staff of the Ealing Soup Kitchen? Yeah, so it's, it was really difficult at first because we've got quite a lot of volunteers. So we've got loads of church volunteers. Then we've got... Uh, volunteers from the community mm. um, and some are um, some actually got COVID themselves so they had to kind of stay away for ages and then no, um, no one passed away no no oh, one passed away thankfully good, but yeah. we have had we had a client in uh, in hospital for over a month and a half I think um, okay. in the ICU because wow. of COVID so and they're now in a nurse ho nursing home rehabilitating so it is really hard but I think um yeah, a lot because of the way it's been set up, and you know when this whole thing kicked off, sort of nobody really knew what was going on. Yeah. The government said they did, but I don't think anybody because we we didn't hear about the two meter thing until at least a couple of weeks in. Yeah, you know? yeah. And we were probably all way too close to one another before that. It was uh, so it was so when we first started, we were really trying to limit the services. So normally, where we would have had ten volunteers, we now had two. Okay. But then equally, we, we didn't do as much because it, we were basically okay. just serving food because we couldn't have them in. Oh, yes. It was a little easier to manage that. But, um, yeah, we've had to rely a lot more on um, on people from the community supporting us in that way so that we've got a lot more charities involved delivering food to us and okay. things that normally we would do ourselves, but we can't. So, so okay. it's been a little bit harder in that sense, but it's starting to come back to normal. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So moving forward, um, how would you think the government can have more of an impact in helping these homeless people? I think the, the first thing is listening to them. It's really hard because they are the voiceless people. They're the people that yeah. kind of, they, they want to say so much, but they don't have any conduits to, to speak because nobody would listen to them. They, they book people like me to speak for them, I suppose. And I think that that's really hard because I think a lot of them feel like they're left out, they're the gum on people's shoes. Mm. Um, and uh, I think hearing their problems and hearing what's going on with them and doing, making an effort to try and sort out the little things in their lives. But I think we assume when someone's homeless what they need is a house, but often it's not that. Often mm. it's like they may, maybe they develop an addiction on the street, which is very, very easy to do. I think we assume that they're all drug users or alcohol users and they were that like that before the streets, but often that's not the case. Mm. It's because it's really cheap to get that sort of stuff and you're so depressed that you don't care about yourself. And so often that, that, that kind of is the precursor. So often you can put someone in a house, but if they're not ready for that house, then um, they will end up getting kicked out or, or leaving the place. So it's, it's just, it's going around, I think the government needs to go around to charities and find out exactly what it is people need. Um, and, and listen to people because I think we think oh it's all about housing yes we definitely need to house them but we also need to get them sorted first and that starts with a conversation and I think that's very London let's just throw money at the problem oh, rather yeah. than actually sort of deal with, deal with the yeah. re repercussions and I think that's what we're I think now, once COVID is over, we're going to start seeing more of that, where people are going to start saying, we need to have honest conversations about these, and the government is going to be forced to do that. Now, in, in an ideal world, I, I hope that, that that's, that's what happens. Yeah, oh, lovely. So what's next for the soup kitchen? Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing for us, really, is to try and get back up and running. Um, oh, yeah. We had a few things that we were trialing when COVID went down, so we would love to kind of start those things back up. Um, and be able to get more people involved um, we've started seeing different types of volunteers coming through with different skill sets okay um, so I'm really hoping that we can continue that during COVID we've also started a home delivery service which we never used to do oh, but okay. because there's so many people who are in need and who are shielding you know, even a lot of the guys that we've got in hostels they can't get out to go to the to um to drop in so we're, we're going and making sure that people are dropping to them and to other people from the community so it's it's sort of 
how we how do we continue that going forward and i think most people will tell you there's a great deal of uncertainty mm. and we're not really sure what we're supposed to be doing but um what we want to do is just move forward and try and um help as much as many people as we were before and and also just to be able to continue that because i suspect and i think most homeless charities would agree that the numbers of homeless people are going to go up now mm. i think um, lots of people have lost their jobs Oh, yeah. um, and they haven't been able to get another job and they will end up in a situation where they're going to need charities like ours and how do we as a small charity um, answer them how do we um, respond to that um, to that problem and, and I think the solution is to kind of um, to come together as churches and, and maybe expand a little bit about what we do but we need to have that conversation it's been difficult to have that conversation because we've been probably 300, 400% more busy than we were before because yeah. um because there's so many different things going on now. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's just the case with uh, Faith World too. Yes, it is. Mm. It, it most definitely is. So tell us, how can we keep up with Eating Soup Kitchen? Where can we go to find you and what's happening? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we have a, a website, which is just www.eelingsoupkitchen.org. Um, and on there, we've actually got a resource called the Home Seekers Guide. So if you were homeless and you wanted to know where you could go and get food in Ealing, we've got a, uh, a thing that we're developing so that you can find where you can get food, where you can get accommodation, where you can get showers, where you can get all the, the, the real practical stuff that you might need. Um, so we've got that. We've also got social media. We've got YouTube and, and Twitter and Instagram and all of the, the things that everybody has these days. So yeah. we, we're kind of very, we're very prevalent on that. And we, we try to be really honest about what we are doing and sharing with the community because for us it's it's really important that as a Christian charity we are accountable to the people that that, that support us so yeah. we want the churches to know exactly where our money is going exactly what we're doing with it and exactly how many people we're helping so so those are good places to find us but if you wanted to come down and see us at any point please do I mean our contact details are on our website uh, but you can also contact us through any of those social media channels too um, we'd love to come um, we'd love to, to, to have you come down and visit and see what it is that we do and um, and how you can support us. So that'd be amazing. Oh, perfect. Mm. Is there any last things you'd like to share? I think about? I think the main thing I'd like to say, just if, if people um, are, are a bit worried about what they can do when they see a homeless person in the street, um, the main yeah. thing, I would, I would have a conversation with them. I would actually, and I know this sounds really simple and probably this, the hardest thing to do, but if you see someone outside a tube, Try and remember their name. Ask them their name, and, and even just kind of looking at them and saying hello to them wow, in the morning. Yeah. You don't you don't understand how how helpful that is for them, and how much it actually makes them feel. Because the the biggest thing on the streets is mental health. Once your once your mental health plummets, it's really hard to come back from that. Mm -hmm. So if you know if you're walking past someone and they remember your name, it's it is a huge boost. They like you know I'm I'm not invisible. Mentally, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. So you can start with that. You know, you don't have to kind of go, oh, well, I don't want to give them money and things. You don't even need to bring that into it. Just okay. have a conversation with them. And, you know, maybe you can offer to pray with them. Quite often they will. If you if you say, can I pray with you? Quite often they will say, yes, please. You know, because they just want to get, um, they want to get the help that they need. So, so that's a really, really, that's my top tip. And obviously, I know it's really difficult sometimes to do that, and particularly with two meter distancing. But once we start coming out of that and things start going back to normal, I think it's really important that we... Um, if we change the culture of how we respond yes. to poverty, yes. we might change the culture of poverty itself. You know, and I think that is, you know, and that's exactly what Jesus would do. He would go and have a conversation with people. Yeah. You know, it's like when um, people were up, you know, above the roofs trying to find Jesus, and he would oh, kind yes. of, he would be the, he would gravitate towards them, the ones that he knew needed the help. Yes. And I think that a lot of the guys on the streets, they do need that help. And I know we're busy, and we have lots. of, busy lives and busy jobs and things like that but we could probably spare 30 seconds just to say hi how are you remember their name and you know maybe maybe if they need something we can get that for them but you know it doesn't take much to be a blessing you know and i was homeless for a while when i first moved to london so i kind of really oh, understand yeah. what that is like and it's really important just to continue that relationship building because that that is what saves lives and then everything else the stuff that we do that's not as important because once they start to feel like they're um their mental health is is better they will be able to respond in a better way and we'll be able to help them a lot quicker because you know so true. yeah so so that's the thing i would say and stress to any of the viewers that really just kind of have that conversation i know it's hard but you know honestly it will be worth it in the end
Oh, perfect. It was lovely hearing all of this. It actually changed my, my mentality because normally we'd offer to give the money, but a kind word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you for coming. No worries. Thank you so much it's for having me. It's such a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for watching. It's such a pleasure being here. I hope you've learned something. I will see you soon. I know how it is to starve, you know? It's not easy. Hi, I am Christy Paul, and I have a strong passion in my heart to see people come to Christ. Join me as we raise up an army of powerful prayer warriors with the same passion to see Jesus Christ glorified and to bring this nation of ours back to God.